In today's video, we're going to take a look back on some of the most horrifying pieces of lost media I've covered on this channel. All of the clips are from over two years ago, so if you're a newer subscriber who hasn't binged my old content, hopefully all these will be new to you, but of course feel free to skip over any you remember. There's a range of topics covered in this video, including murder, SA, and self-surgery. All are extremely not safe for life, so proceed with caution if you think you might be triggered by anything you're about to hear. If you think you can handle it, you can check out the uncut version of this video on Kofi, which contains extra entries that are even more disturbing. I'll leave a link to that in the description. And with all that said, let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can become a Kofi member or a channel member to gain access to uncut videos and other perks, or you can leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. I'm sure you're aware of Hugh Hefner, we'll call him Hef, but if not, he was the founder and editor-in-chief of Playboy magazine, a publication featuring revealing photos of women and articles targeted towards men. He was certainly one of the most iconic womanizers of recent times, and when he wasn't married, it wasn't unusual for him to be in casual relationships with many women at once. After he died in 2017, at the age of 91, it was revealed that years earlier, he arranged for a casket to be lined with cement so his collection of tapes, photos and letters could be encased in it and dumped at sea. Before we dive into this theory, I just want to say, as with all my other conspiracy videos, that none of this is fact, it's just a theory that I came up with after doing some research. I don't even necessarily believe it myself, I'm just presenting the information as I found it so you can make your own mind up. The obvious reason for dumping the tapes, and the one given by the source who's referenced in articles about this, is to protect the reputations of the people who feature in them. No estimate of the number of tapes was given in any of the articles I read about this, but I'm guessing there were quite a few to fill a whole casket. They reportedly dated back from the 1950s to the mid-1990s, and during that time and after, a number of public figures have been associated with Hef and have visited the mansion, so the list of people who could feature on these tapes is extensive. As for the content of them, here's a quote from page6.com. There was a batch of tapes shot on 8mm and cinefilm, which were filmed during some of the obvious he enjoyed in the 70s. Some famous male movie stars too were in those videos, and had that come out it would have been a huge scandal. Hef also had thousands of photographs taken at photo shoots or given to him by the girls over the years. Marilyn Monroe was definitely in them, as well as many superstars who graced the pages of his magazine. Some of the women were in relationships, and others never even made the magazine, but simply were partying with him. He had hundreds of other photographs of women who were not famous, but he had enjoyed one-night stands with, or even short relationships. There were also audio tapes too. So it sounds like whatever is on those tapes could ruin reputations and relationships. There are some wild stories about the mansion and what went on inside it, so I imagine there's probably a lot of footage there that certainly wouldn't be classed as vanilla. But what if there's a darker reason that Hef went to such great lengths to make sure that no one would ever see the contents of that casket? The decision to put the tapes in a concrete-filled casket and dump them in the ocean is certainly a little bit extra, but it also suggests that they contain things that Hef really didn't want getting out. Sure, reputations could be ruined and marriages destroyed, and that's bad enough, for sure. But maybe that's only scratching the surface. Before we speculate, let's take a quick look at the history of controversy surrounding Hef. The simple fact that he was a man who promotes female nudity and a promiscuous lifestyle was enough to spark backlash from feminists and religious groups way back when Playboy was founded. It was pretty much the first magazine to present those kinds of adult themes in a relatively sophisticated format, and a lot of people were uncomfortable with that. Hef has been involved in various scandals over the years which we'll discuss, but to his credit, he was an advocate of racial equality and LGBTQ rights, even as far back as the 1950s, which for the time was quite progressive. 
He also donated to charity and various charity events were held at the Playboy Mansion. But according to many reports, the idyllic picture painted off the mansion was closer to fantasy than reality. A few women have spoken out about what life was really like, with common claims including that Hef was controlling and pushed the women to do things that they weren't comfortable with. Some claimed they were pressured into engaging in unprotected group activity and even taking drugs. A claim corroborated by Hef's ex-girlfriend, Holly Madison, who wrote a memoir about her experiences. Here's a quote from the book. Would you like a quaalude? Hef asked, leaning toward me with a bunch of large horse pills in his hands, held together by a crumpled tissue. Okay, that's good, Hef said nonchalantly. Usually I don't approve of drugs, but you know, in the 70s, they used to call these pills thigh openers. In the book, she also mentions that the women had a curfew and that Hef threatened to evict someone before for getting back late. He also apparently didn't like them dating other men, even though he was okay to see as many women as he wanted, even having seven girlfriends at one point. He controlled what the bunnies did and they had to ask permission to go out without him and if they were allowed, they had to be back by 9pm. The bottom line is, Hef's relationships were transactional. There's a certain expectation that I guess needs to be met if you're being paid to be someone's girlfriend, but there are still lines that should never be crossed. Many of these women just thought that they'd be paid to be models or waitresses and dress in skimpy outfits. They did not sign up to be pressured into things that they weren't comfortable with. Holly even said herself that she didn't realise that there would literally be an expectation for her to sleep with her. I watched a couple of episodes for research purposes, then somehow got hooked watching The Girls Next Door, a reality show that first aired in 2005, which focuses on Holly, Kendra and Bridget, Hef's girlfriends at the time. There were a few moments that made me wonder if these women had almost been primed by their families to be in the position that they're in. I don't get jealous of other girls because I was raised in a cloning lab to be the perfect woman for Hugh M. Hefner, so... At one point in a later season, Kendra talks to her family about leaving Hef and the mansion, and they're not supportive at all. They literally just encourage her to stay. I'm thinking about moving out of the mansion. For heaven's sake, what are you going to do? It's so safe. It's secure. I know it's secure there. I know I have everything I could possibly want. Who would leave that? There's also an episode in season two where Bridget strips in front of a family and one of them, it might have been a dad, but I couldn't really tell, wolf whistles. It's just so gross. Stuff like this just makes me wonder if some of the women's parents pushed them into the situation that they're in. I wonder if they were raised differently, if they'd still want to be living that life. Age obviously factors into it too. Kendra was only 18 when she moved into the mansion. More recently, years after her and Hef broke up, Kendra said that she didn't enjoy sleeping with him and she had to consume a lot of alcohol and other substances to survive those nights. Though for what it's worth, she claims that they remained friends after the breakup. In addition to being heavily criticised for the way he treated his girlfriends, Hef was accused of facilitating a non-consensual encounter between a woman and Bill Cosby, who also used quaaludes when assaulting women, and Hef himself has been accused of forcing himself on women. His lack of respect for women's consent is hardly surprising considering he literally referred to them as objects in an interview. The first ever issue of Playboy featured Marilyn Monroe as Hef bought the rights to the photos from a photographer who was begged by Marilyn not to reveal her identity. She posed for them before she became famous and Hef never asked her permission to include them in the magazine, even on the cover. They never actually met, but Hef appeared to have a bit of a weird obsession with her. When she died, he bought the plot next to her grave and is now buried next to her. Marilyn wasn't the only woman whose photos were made public without permission. Vanna White appeared on the cover of an issue in 1987, though not through her own choice. She even begged Hef, who she considered a friend at the time, not to publish the photos, saying it could ruin her career, but he did it anyway. I could go on all day about this, but I think we've heard enough to suggest that Hef was a morally questionable man. Knowing everything he's been accused of by various different people, it really makes me wonder what's actually on those tapes. I'd be willing to bet money that it's more nefarious than just celebrities cheating on each other. I just get the vibe that the casket contains something incriminating. It's pure speculation, but I just don't think he would have gone to such great lengths to get rid of them, 
just to protect other people's reputations. He obviously made them in the first place for a reason. It doesn't make sense that he'd just randomly destroy them. And I just don't buy the story that the parties were getting wilder and wilder and he thought that someone might steal them. He had the money to hire a security guard to guard them constantly during parties if he was that worried or he could have installed some kind of hidden compartment somewhere in his mansion so they'd never be found. In addition, knowing what Hef did to Varna White, I have a hard time believing that he'd care enough about other people's reputations to destroy part of his life's work. So what could that casket contain? Best case scenario, I have an inkling that some of those people maybe didn't realise that they were being filmed. I mean, why would they consent to being filmed doing something that could ruin the reputation if it got made public? It just doesn't make sense. Even if everyone knew they were being filmed, it still doesn't seem unlikely that not all of them would have been in a position to consent to that and whatever else was happening, possibly due to drugs or coercion. I can only hope that everyone who featured in those tapes were adults at least, but I don't even know that we can be sure of that. There have been rumours over the years that underage girls attended Hef's parties. Judy Huth claimed that she was a victim of Bill Cosby at the Playboy Mansion when she was just 15 years old. That's not necessarily to say that Hef was aware of that, but there are a couple of relevant things that make you wonder if he just turned a blind eye. In 1975, with her mother's permission, 10-year-old Brooke Shields posed naked for a Playboy publication called Sugar and Spice. I strongly advise you not to look for these photos. I read an article which showed a few that were censored, thankfully, but let's just say the tone of these photos does not seem innocent. I don't know if Hef personally approved these photos or what, but he was literally the founder of Playboy. If he had a problem with these images featuring in one of his publications, he could probably prevent it happening in the first place, or at least condemn it once it did, if he didn't personally oversee that. But as far as I could see, he's never spoken out about it. Similarly, Eva Ionesco is the youngest model ever to appear in the Playboy magazine, featuring at just 11 years old in a 1976 issue of the Italian edition of the magazine. I don't exactly know how magazine publishing works, perhaps Hef didn't really get a say in the Italian edition, but again, surely you could have spoken out about that. Even if everyone at the mansion and whoever was filmed were adults, there are still so many vile possibilities, one being beast which Hef was rumoured to be into. Linda Marchiano claimed that she was out to Hef by her abusive husband and that he tried to make her have inappropriate contact with a dog. He said himself that he tried several times to get a girl and a dog together, but it never worked out. I also considered the possibility that in addition to serving as some kind of library for Hef, and probably a trophy too, perhaps those tapes were actually intended to be used for blackmail at some point. Or maybe some of them even were used for blackmail purposes before they were destroyed. Particularly if the people in them weren't even aware that they were being filmed, they probably contained so much that some people just wouldn't want making public, and would probably go to great lengths to prevent that from happening. It's a plausible possibility if you believe Stefan Tettenbaum's account of Hef and what went down in the mansion. Stefan was Hef's valet for a year, starting in 1978, and in an interview with New York Post, recalled a few worrying stories from his time at the mansion. He said that the acts that the women took part in were so painful that they sometimes couldn't walk afterwards and that Hef sometimes gave them bonuses in those situations. Stefan claimed that Hef always filmed the encounters and had a whole library featuring various different people, which corroborates the existence of these tapes to begin with. He was told that Hef planned to use the footage against his associates if they ever threatened to come out with a memoir about him or the mansion. But seriously, what's he got to hide? Many people already don't have a particularly positive opinion of him, and hearing some of the stories that are public knowledge from the mansion, as well as the fact that Hef had seven girlfriends at one point, you can already imagine that he's probably pretty adventurous. To top it off, he openly admitted to trying to get a dog and a girl together on multiple occasions. If that's just something that he casually spoke about and didn't see a problem with, I can only assume that whatever it was he was trying to keep hidden was probably much, much darker. The pieces of the puzzle are all there. To me, it's not a question of whether or not this is a plausible theory, it's just simply, factually, is it true? I'm not sure we'll ever know the answer to that. Hef himself is dead, his head of security died in 2011, and any concrete evidence is God knows where in the middle of the ocean.
Game in the Sand is an unreleased documentary created in 1964. The runtime is around 14 minutes and the film is in black and white. It reportedly involved a cardboard box, four children and a rooster, which is at one point buried up to its neck in sand. Nothing else is known about the plot, but it's thought that the rooster was killed and that there were other disturbing occurrences. Six years after Game in the Sand, the director, Werner Herzog, released a comedy drama film titled Even Dwarfs. During filming, an actor was accidentally set on fire and run over by a truck, and there were some very controversial incidents involving animals. Werner has compared the production of both movies, but said in relation to Game in the Sand that things got out of hand, and therefore he never released the movie, even hinting that he might destroy it before his death. I would say things got out of hand would be an understatement regarding even dwarfs, and it's safe to assume that whatever happened during the filming of Game in the Sand was even worse, considering only three or four people have been allowed to see it. McKamey Manor is, or was, an extreme haunted house where people would literally be tortured emotionally and physically. It seems to have closed, for now at least, but I wouldn't rule out it ever making a comeback. Around 2019, everyone was talking about the manor, and Russ McKamey came under heavy scrutiny for facilitating such an experience. Each participant had to meet a set of requirements, including proving that they had medical insurance and being deemed physically and mentally fit by a doctor. They also had to sign a 40-page contract, which basically granted Russ permission to do whatever he wanted to them, including, but not limited to, shaving their hair off and pulling out their teeth. These people were volunteering for this and kinda knew what they were letting themselves in for, but actually being in that position is a whole different thing, and they reportedly weren't allowed to revoke their consent at any time. Russ was accused of getting some kind of sick enjoyment out of torturing these people, and petitions were signed to close down the manor. The whole experience was filmed, and hours and hours of footage was uploaded to YouTube, though it's probable that some has never been seen publicly. The videos that are online now are hard enough to watch, and if he's totally happy showing that to the world, I can't help but wonder how much darker the potential unreleased footage is. Well, trepanning is uh, making a hole in the skull. Well, the reason is to increase the volume of blood in the brain. And what does that do? Well, it gives you more energy and a bit more consciousness. I've been researching lost media a lot recently, and I came across a partially found documentary titled Heartbeat in the Brain. The documentary was directed by and starred Amanda Fielding, a drug policy reformer, lobbyist, and research coordinator, and was filmed by her partner, Joey Mellon. Amanda produced the documentary with the agenda of making trepanation available on the NHS. Before we discuss the documentary, let's take a look into the history of trepanation and what it actually is. Trepanation is the ancient practice of drilling a hole in the skull for various reasons. It's actually one of the oldest medical procedures known to man, and throughout history has had a fluctuating but surprisingly high survival rate. The earliest trepanations were thought to have a survival rate of around 40%, so more people died than survived, but considering what a risky procedure it is, done so long ago without proper equipment, or even knowledge of pathogens and sanitization, that's not actually that bad. Between 5 and 10% of all skulls found from the Neolithic period had holes in them. Some even showed evidence of multiple trepanations, with the holes at different stages of healing, suggesting that they were done at different stages of the life, as opposed to all at once. In ancient times, trepanation instruments were basically just sharp objects made from flint, stone, or obsidian. The Greeks and the Romans were the first to design proper medical instruments to perform the procedure. There seems to have been five main methods, varying at different times in history and different locations. Rectangular intersecting cuts, 
scraping using an abrasive instrument, circular grooving, cutting using a circular saw, and drilling several holes in close proximity and then cutting away the bone from in between. Throughout history, trepanation has been performed for both medical reasons and spiritual and religious reasons. It's still performed for medical reasons today, though it's more commonly known as craniotomy or craniectomy, in both procedures, the removed part of the skull is eventually returned. A craniotomy can be performed on a patient with a brain tumour. A section of skull is removed to gain access to the tumour in order to remove it. The section of skull is returned as soon as the tumour has been removed. A craniectomy is normally done following a traumatic brain injury or a condition that causes the brain to swell. A section of skull is removed to relieve pressure on the brain and is eventually put back, though it could be months after the initial surgery. If you've ever seen the Saw movies, spoiler alert, this is the procedure that Dr. Denlon does on John Kramer, and apparently that scene is actually pretty accurate. The bone flap cannot always be returned, sometimes if there's an infection of the bone, an artificial bone will be used in its place. As far as I'm aware, there's no proven medical reason for a section of the skull to be removed permanently, and this is where voluntary trepanation comes in. Craniotomies and craniectomies performed by proper surgeons are relatively rare and often emergency surgery, though there are some people who have chosen to undergo trepanation for no valid medical reasons. The logic behind this is that when humans began walking upright, this reduced blood flow to the brain. All babies are born with a soft area on the top of the skull, which factually is to reduce pressure on the brain as it's growing so quickly. Theoretically, children have a higher state of consciousness before the skull closes, as when it does, the pulsation of the heartbeat is inhibited. The loss of pulse pressure affects the ratio of blood and cerebral spinal fluid, and that apparently contributes to the onset of diseases including dementia and Alzheimer's. Therefore, a hole in the skull is supposed to increase the volume of blood in the brain and allow it to pulsate as it should, a heartbeat in the brain. This apparently allows you to return to a childlike state in terms of consciousness. There are countless benefits that have been linked without evidence to trepanation throughout history, including relief from anxiety, depression and other mood disorders, less frequent and severe headaches, heightened perception, restoration of youthfulness, removal of bad spirits, and higher energy levels. It's also believed that it can make you feel high. Someone in the Hole in the Head documentary said that if LSD was at 100, cannabis at 50 to 60, trepanation would be at 30. The popularity of the procedure has varied over time. When lobotomies were first performed before World War I, they somewhat replaced trepanation, though there was a renewed interest around the 1960s. Bart Hughes was a Dutch librarian and proponent of trepanation. After attending medical school, he was refused a degree due to his advocacy of LSD research, and he even named his daughter Maria Joanna. He used to stand on his head to increase blood supply and supposedly experience a temporary high, then he eventually moved on to promoting trepanation. On the 6th of January 1965, he performed trepanation on himself while someone took photos of it. He went to a local hospital to get an x-ray to prove that he had actually drilled a hole in his skull, a decision that would backfire. Psychologists saw him and suspected he was schizophrenic, so decided to hold him against his will for three weeks. He had to undergo various psychological tests, which surprisingly, eventually indicated that he was completely sane. Bart's extreme publicity stunt really brought awareness to trepanation, and he wasn't the only one to get it done or to do it to himself. John Lennon from The Beatles was considering the procedure and even tried to get Paul McCartney and others to get it done as a group activity. Paul wasn't exactly down, and the man John asked to perform it apparently believed that John already had a third eye, which seems to be referring to the possibility that his skull never fused together, as is the case in around 10% of people, according to some sources. Joey Mellon, inspired by Bart, decided to attempt self-trepanation himself, but it didn't exactly go too well. He tried and failed twice before finally succeeding with the help of his partner, Amanda Fielding. The first time, he used a hand-turned trepanning device, 
and the second attempt caused him to end up in hospital where he was reprimanded and sent for psychiatric evaluation. I'm kind of curious as to how he failed twice, but at the same time I'm not really sure I want to know. Did he panic and stop halfway through or was penetrating the skull harder than he thought? The Hole in the Head documentary shows a few other people who have self-trepanned, most of whom speak positively about the effects. A woman who had to have the procedure done for medical reasons is also featured. She suffered a life-threatening injury, though doesn't specify exactly what or why it was decided that the skull piece shouldn't be returned. She says her running has improved since the operation and she feels less stressed and more relaxed, though she acknowledges that these changes may be due to a change in attitude or the simple fact that she was so happy to be alive after the injury. Around a year after the procedure, she decided to have the hole filled in. It sounds like she was worried about her skull not being able to withstand as much damage if she got into an accident, which could cause brain damage. Since the hole was repaired, she says she doesn't feel as euphoric or full of energy, though she still has creative spurts, particularly when writing. She feels more stressed and recalls feeling carefree before the hole was filled, but thinks that might be because the novelty, for lack of a better word, of being alive after such a serious injury is starting to wear off. I really recommend checking out the Hole in the Head documentary, it is grim but fascinating. My favourite part though is the song at the end, which is basically just a mashup of phrases that people have said throughout the show, with a beat behind it. Time to stop the drilling, drilling. The operation is about to begin. It's an odd contrast between such a morbid topic and an upbeat tune. Anyway, now we've covered some context, let's move on to Heartbeat in the Brain, a title that makes me feel really queasy since I now know what all this is about. Amanda Fielding met Bart Hughes in 1966, not long after he self-trepanned. She already had an interest in the procedure, but it seemed like Bart inspired her, and after four years of trying and failing to find a doctor to perform the procedure, she decided to do it herself at the age of 27. She prepared well by getting all the tools she needed, including a spare drill in case the first one broke, which it did. As an advocate for trepanation becoming available on the NHS, she decided she was going to film the whole thing as somewhat of a publicity stunt. The documentary was thought to be lost media for some time, as it had never been seen since the first screening in 1978 in a gallery in New York. More than one audience member fainted, understandably, and everyone else was very shook up, so presumably Amanda had the only copy and kept it under wraps. That was until April 2011, when it was publicly screened at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. Again, the documentary was not well received. I don't think there's any way it could have been, considering the graphic and pseudoscientific nature. A few clips of Heartbeat in the Brain were shown in the Hole in the Head documentary, and you can also find some clips in Season 3 of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. I'm not sure how long the procedure took or how long the documentary was in total, but you can only find around two to three minutes worth of footage online. As much as I am kind of curious to see the rest of it, part of me is kind of glad that I can't, because those two to three minutes were more than enough. They show brief clips of the preparation and the procedure itself while Amanda explains what's happening and stresses that she does not recommend that people try self-trepanation as it's not a thing for lay people to do. She says she's showing the film now with hopes that it might attract the attention of a doctor who is willing and able to start researching the topic. There are also random shots of her pet pigeon and I like pigeons but there's something very eerie about these shots paired with the foreboding music. Just that I'm absolutely not in favour of self trepanation. Maybe it's better to say it's a film about my beloved bard. As a side note, when Amanda is interviewed in Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, she says that she knows that telepathy exists because she had a quote, passionate love affair with the pigeon. Love making, sweet, just enchanting her. He'd do it with the sound. It was a very kind of complete. Love. I don't exactly know what that means, but she said that he was hypnotic and had a call that you couldn't resist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Anyway, after the procedure, Amanda gets dressed up and goes out to a party like nothing even happened. Eight years later, she said that the experience was as good, if not better, than she'd hoped. I've searched pretty thoroughly for the full documentary online, and if it even exists on the internet, it's certainly not easy to find. It's only been publicly screened twice, though Amanda has had private viewing parties with friends, so perhaps one of them had a copy and leaked it onto the internet. I found a few comments online, reviews on websites, on the videos about it on YouTube and Reddit, from people claiming to have seen the whole thing, or at least more clips than are available now. One user remembered seeing it on TV and described small details that are not seen in the clips available on YouTube. Another recalled there being a URL at the end of the Hole in the Head documentary, which was supposed to be a link to the full Heartbeat in the Brain documentary, though they saw that years after the documentary was released, and by the time they typed in the URL, it was a dead link. These anecdotes could suggest that it is online out there somewhere, but they also could be partly due to false memories. Maybe the person who recalls seeing the whole thing on TV actually saw the Hole in the Head documentary on TV which features clips of Heartbeat in the Brain, and without realising, they just filled the gaps in the memory when recalling it years later. The URL which the Reddit user remembers being at the end of Hole in the Head is now an occupied and for sale, though Wayback Machine shows a couple of archives. None of the archives feature the full documentary or any clips, and there's no sign that it ever did, though it's hard to say from the limited number. There are a few websites that claim to have the whole thing available to stream, but it seems to just be clickbait. By most accounts, the full documentary is not available and has never been released online. Amanda is well aware that it's a controversial documentary and only allowed a few selected clips to feature in Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia. It sounds like she doesn't want to shock people or to threaten her recent research into LSD, amongst other things. So it's unlikely that she herself will ever choose to release the film, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. In modern times, trepanation has become a very controversial topic, those who are against it argue that you must be mentally ill to even want a hole in your head, let alone to drill it yourself. The vast majority of doctors agree that accepting necessary craniotomy or craniectomy procedures performed by medical professionals, trepanation has no medical benefit, and in addition to the risks taken when the procedure is performed, there are also potential long-term risks as well. We all have a skull for a reason, to protect the brain, so cutting a hole in it is bound to increase the risk of brain damage in the event of an accident, a risk that would increase with a larger hole. Most people in the Hole in the Head documentary only drilled small holes, no bigger than a centimetre, so their risk is probably relatively low, but I still feel like a hole of any size could surely weaken the skull in general. All evidence behind the benefits of trepanation is anecdotal and could easily be explained by the placebo effect. Trepanation, particularly self-trepanation, is such an extreme thing to do. You'd have to be very convinced that it was going to work, and once you had done it, you'd probably be more likely to look for the benefits because you wouldn't want to feel like you'd wasted your time. I mean, imagine you just drilled a hole in your skull. You would not want to think that that was all for nothing. Proponents of trepanation argue that it hasn't actually been scientifically studied in recent times, so a lack of evidence doesn't necessarily disprove its reported effectiveness. There were some reports around 2018 of trepanation becoming a trend within the body mod community. Most seemed to believe it would elevate their consciousness, but it seems that some people just thought it looked cool, like a tattoo or a piercing. I hope no one actually got trepan just because they thought it looked cool, though. According to Ryoichi Kerope, a body mod expert, it's still considered extreme modification in today's scene. It's mostly done underground because it's illegal in some places. So it's reassuring that it's not too common, but there's always a higher risk for those getting the procedure if it's not done by a medical professional. I wasn't able to find any reports of recent deaths as a result of self-trepanation, so hopefully they're not common. Following her self-trepanation, Amanda went on to run for British Parliament twice attempting to make trepanation available on the NHS. Unsurprisingly, she never really got anywhere with that, but she is still an advocate and doesn't appear to have ever expressed regret about getting the procedure done. While I would never ever recommend getting it done, perhaps there is an argument to be made for doctors performing trepanation. 
Amanda couldn't find a doctor to do it for her, so she did it herself, and she wasn't the only one. One way or another, these people were going to get a hole in their head. If we can't stop them, maybe we should at least offer a safer way, as the risks are increased significantly with self-trepanation. That would also open up an opportunity for research, if someone wants it done anyway and would resort to doing it themselves if they couldn't find a doctor. I want it done. They might as well study on me. I'm a fairly normal person. I'm sure there are people out there who have gotten this procedure done and regretted it, but clearly some people feel like it's totally transformed their lives. And at least some of those people have been the subject of psychological testing and found to not be mentally ill. Just to reiterate, I'm not in favour of the procedure whatsoever, I'm just trying to consider both sides here. I personally think the benefits that have been reported are more than likely as a result of the placebo effect. Trepanation hasn't been the subject of clinical trials, though most doctors seem to agree that any reported benefits and the logic behind them stems from a misunderstanding of anatomy and biology. As a result, it's unlikely to be researched properly by credible scientists, and the potential ethical issues posed make it very unlikely that a study of that kind would ever be approved. As well as her trepanation campaigns, Amanda has done a lot of research into psychoactive drugs over the years and believes that they should be legalised. She founded the Beckley Foundation in 1998, a non-profit organisation which investigates the effects of psychoactive substances on the brain and consciousness. It also focuses on reforming global drug policies based on health, harm reduction, cost effectiveness and human rights. Amanda herself has experimented with these substances. Articles in October 2019 reported that she'd been experimenting with psychedelics for 54 years. She's studied those substances as possible treatments for anxiety, depression and for various other reasons. She turned 78 this year and it sounds like she's still on it. I hope I'm not the only one who's interested in rumoured lost media that may not even exist. A perfect example is Last Breath Studios, about which there is very little information online. One of the few mentions I found about it was from VK.com, which appears to be like a Russian Facebook. It's a post about videos that are on the internet but very difficult to find, and the last part on Last Breath Studios translates to Films from Last Breath Studio a very old snuff pop studio by the standards of the media time. I don't even know if it releases films now, but in the 90s it was popular among those who were interested in the topic of vulgar, perverse murder of a person. Presumably, their most popular movie is Flower Day Snuff, the wear and tear of 18-year-old Tanya Flower Day. This is a private movie which is not particularly distributed anywhere. On the contrary, it was sold on VHS cassettes, even at a time when DVDs were already progressed. It is about this studio that Alexei Balabanov speaks in his interview. Such films in Azerbaijan cost about $15,000. In the United Arab Emirates, they are twice as expensive. Tanya Flowerde is a real person who was actually murdered in South Africa, and news reports suggest her death was filmed. Ronald Grimsley was arrested, and he claimed that he owed money to two drug dealers. He wasn't able to pay, so made a deal. He would give them Tanya, and they'd wipe the debt. The three men assaulted her, and according to Ronald, the dealers murdered her, and it all happened on camera. It doesn't sound like the two dealers were ever caught, if they even existed, that is, as they could have just been fabricated by Ronald in an attempt to lessen his sentence. I'm not sure if the footage was ever found, it at least doesn't appear to be online now. Maybe Ronald or the dealers were associated with Last Breath Studios and distributed the film through the company, but that's just speculation, as there's not much in the way of solid evidence for its existence. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, known as the Moors murderers, killed and assaulted five children between 1963 and 1965. Their victims, male and female, ranged from 10 to 17 years old, and four of them were buried in Saddleworth Moor. Both were convicted of their crimes, and Brady was Britain's longest-serving prisoner. 
He owned two locked briefcases, which his lawyer is still in possession of to this day, and it was speculated that they might contain important information, such as the location of Keith Bennett, one of their victim's bodies. Following his death in 2017, police requested a court order to access the briefcases, but this was denied because Brady had died, as had Hindley years earlier, so nothing could be found that would lead to a prosecution. The police and Keith's brother wrote to the lawyer multiple times asking for the documents to be publicised, though each request was denied. There's actually a decent chance that some of the information in the briefcases will soon be made public, thanks to a new bill which will allow police to obtain information regarding the location of human remains where the suspect is deceased. An even more disturbing piece of lost media is the audio that he and Myra Hindley recorded during the murder of 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downer. In 1964, she was kidnapped by the pair from a fairground and taken back to their home, where they sexually assaulted her before the murder. They then buried her on the Saddleworth Moor. In addition to the 13-minute long tape, Brady took nine photos of her, a cropped edit of one of these can be found online, as can the transcript of the tapes, though the rest of the photos and the tape itself will probably never be released, and I think that's for the best, considering it's literally child porn. A really sad detail is that Leslie's mother had to listen to at least some of the recording to identify her daughter's voice. I doubt she was ever able to forget that. Myra Hindley later admitted to taking photos of the murder of Keith Bennett too, and mentioned that there were other documents relating to their crimes, though Brady ordered her to burn them when he was arrested in 1965. Kenneth Pinion was an engineer who lost the ability to experience certain sensations following a motorcycle accident. As a result, he began experimenting with extreme acts, including the insertion of very large Eventually, he met a group of people online and started meeting with them at a farm, the owner of which apparently unbeknownst to the activity that was occurring there. The men would film each other engaging in activity with the horses and also each other, then share it online. It's been suggested that these men weren't per se, as in it wasn't the animal itself they were attracted to, but rather the large people. On the 2nd of July 2005, Kenneth and another member of the group were filming each other with a horse when Kenneth sustained serious internal injuries, including a perforated colon. He was taken to the hospital, but he had already died by the time he arrived. Following his death, a video circulated online titled Two Guys, One Horse, which was actually one of the first viral reaction videos. It showed Kenneth doing his thing with a horse, but was not the occasion that he died on. I assume that video is still online somewhere, but I have no desire to search for it, and as far as I'm aware, the footage of Kenneth's death is not publicly available. Prior to the incident, Beast was actually legal in Washington state, however Kenneth's death resulted in its ban. The Sun is a British tabloid newspaper that doesn't exactly have the best reputation, it's known for its sensationalist reporting, unethical standards, and various scandals over the years. During a trial related to one of these scandals, the ex-deputy news editor testified that a seven-foot-high safe existed, containing over 30 years' worth of unpublished information, some of which sounds like it would cause outrage and potentially even criminal investigations if it was ever released. Before we get onto the safe and what it might contain, it'd be useful to provide some backstory on the News of the World phone hacking scandal that preceded it. News of the World was a weekly tabloid newspaper that was at one point the world's highest selling English language paper. It mainly focused on celebrity gossip, exposing drug use and sexual misdemeanours with questionably obtained photo and video evidence. They were known for checkbook journalism, which is where reporters pay sources for their information, and while that has its uses, as some individuals won't speak without financial incentive, it's considered unethical by many because it can cast doubt on the credibility of information and on the ability of the reporter to remain unbiased. They also outright lied about some individuals, fabricated stories, and were involved in various other scandals. Wikipedia does a good job of summarising, so I'll read some excerpts. 
The paper began a controversial campaign to name and shame alleged people in July 2000, following the abduction and murder of Sarah Payne in West Sussex. The paper's decision led to some instances of action being taken against those suspected of being child offenders, which included several cases of mistaken identity, including one instance where a paediatrician had her house vandalised, and another where a man was confronted because he had a neck brace similar to one a paediatrician was wearing when pictured. In 2002, Maza Mahmood, an uncover reporter working for the News of the World, also known as the Fake Shaikh, allegedly exposed a plot to kidnap Victoria Beckham. Five men were arrested, but the trial later collapsed when it emerged News of the World had paid its main witness, Florim Gashi, £10,000 to work with Maza Mahmood. Florim Gashi later admitted to working with Mahmood to set up the kidnap plot. In 1988, the parents of actor David Scarborough, who played Mark Fowler on the BBC soap opera EastEnders, commenced libel proceedings with solicitor Michael Shelton due to the hounding of Scarborough whilst he suffered from mental illness. During this time, the News of the World and its sister paper The Sun published stories calling Scarborough a zombie as well as Dracula and purported that he took cocaine. According to the parents, this escalated Scarborough's depression, resulting in his on the 27th of April 1988. In April 2006, England footballer Wayne Rooney received £100,000 in damages from the publishers of the News of the World and its sister paper The Sun over articles falsely reporting that he had slapped his fiancée. In 2009, Barry George, a man who had been falsely convicted of murdering television presenter Jill Dando, won a libel claim filed against the publisher of the News of the World after the paper fabricated quotes to suggest he had stalked other women. In 2011, Polish footballer Arta Baroque won an out-of-court settlement against the News of the World after the newspaper made false allegations that he was unfaithful to his girlfriend. Baroque was paid £70,000 and a full apology was issued. In addition, former Features editor Paul McMullen admitted in 2010 that News of the World, specifically his own articles, had contributed significantly to Jennifer Elliott taking her own life, in his opinion. He had published information about her in numerous articles over the years that had been obtained after his colleague bribed a police officer. I hope you've heard enough to persuade you that the paper was absolute trash. Not only did they show blatant disregard for people's mental health and personal relationships, but risked hindering criminal investigations and more than likely contributed to the deaths of more than one individual. That's not all though, the most notorious controversy surrounding the paper is what led to its demise in 2011, the phone hacking scandal. Back in 2005, senior aides to the British royal family started to become suspicious when they noticed new messages showing up in their voicemails that had already been listened to, among other unusual things. More worryingly, stories began appearing in News of the World about Prince William. Nothing particularly juicy, for example a headline about him pulling a tendon in his knee, but he hadn't spoken about that publicly, so it was initially suspected that there might be a mole. When another article popped up about William borrowing a portable editing suite from ITV royal correspondent Tom Brady, he realised someone must have been accessing his voicemails, as only those two knew about the arrangement and hadn't told anyone else. They contacted the Metropolitan Police and an investigation was launched, which found that it was the senior aides phones that had been hacked, and those of government ministers, military chiefs, footballers and celebrities too. This was back before smartphones were widespread, and if you remember the struggle of having to press one button four times just to type the letter S, you'll know that leaving a voicemail about important issues was much easier than typing out a long text. Hence information was gained from hacking the voicemails. A few years prior to this revelation, it had become clear that an organised trade in confidential personal information had developed and was widely used by British newspapers. Some of this information was obtained via illegal means, such as entrapment, blackmail and burglaries, in addition to phone and computer hacking. Between 1999 and 2003, as part of Operation Nigeria, several private investigators who were providing information to News of the World were convicted for crimes including drug distribution, CP, corruption and planting evidence, though none were charged with illegal acquisition of confidential information. So this activity was nothing new, but it had stepped up a notch now members of the royal family were being targeted. 
Police began surveilling Clive Goodman, former royal editor for News of the World, and Glenn Mulcair, former footballer turned private investigator who also worked for the paper. And during this time, Clive reported on a story about Prince Harry visiting a strip club, more information that was not public knowledge. In August 2006, the pair were arrested and later charged with hacking various phones. During the trial, it was revealed that they had made a total of 609 calls to the royal staff members' numbers, which is how they were able to access the voicemails after guessing the pins. Clive pled guilty to the charges and was sentenced to four months in prison, and Glenn was jailed for six months. Clive was fired from News of the World and even had the audacity to file an unfair dismissal claim. That might not be as ridiculous as it first sounds, though, as the royal hacking scandal was only the tip of the iceberg, and arguably, Clive may have simply been a product of an industry that was rife with such behaviour. Throughout the investigation, police had been criticised for honing in on associates of the royal family who had been hacked, largely ignoring the numerous other victims, even though several thousand phone numbers of potential hacking victims and 91 phone pin codes had been found in Glenn's possession. Not to mention God knows how many other journalists working for various tabloids that were likely using the same unethical methods to obtain the next sensational headline. Scotland Yard was accused of turning a blind eye to this activity within News of the World because of their close relationship, probably not helped by the fact that some officers allegedly took bribes from the journalists and they, the Press Complaints Commission and News International, former publisher of News of the World, assured the public that no other journalists had been involved. It wasn't until 2011 that wider scale investigations were launched into the hacking and bribery allegations, after journalists from The Guardian and other papers reported on evidence that suggested this activity was still ongoing, and more widespread than the public initially realised. Police had previously refused to investigate further, which caused several public figures who had allegedly been hacked to begin litigation proceedings against News International, and during one of these, evidence of indirect hacking, breaches of national security, and serious crime was found. Operation Wheating focused on the phone hacking and commenced on the 26th of January 2011, with around 45 officers investigating, which increased to 60 a few months later, then 90 the following year. On the 4th of July, The Guardian reported that police had found evidence to suggest that News of the World journalists had hired private investigators to hack into Millie Dowler's voicemail. Millie was 13 years old when she was reported missing in March 2002 after failing to return home from school. Tragically, her remains were found in September that year and it turned out she'd been murdered the day after she disappeared. The Guardian initially reported that News of the World journalists had deleted messages to clear space for new ones, which gave the family false hope because they thought Millie must still be alive and had deleted them herself. But in actuality, the phone automatically deleted messages 72 hours after they'd been opened. Nevertheless, they had hacked a missing girl's phone, and what's worse, it was revealed in 2012 that Surrey Police and others were made aware of the incident shortly after they knew of Millie's death and took no action, instead inviting the staff to a meeting to discuss the case. On the 7th of July, just three days after The Guardian's article, Rupert Murdoch, who owned News of the World, announced that the paper would be discontinued. The final edition would be on the 12th of July 2011, and all proceeds were to go to good causes, with advertising space given to charities. Following the scandal, several senior employees and executives resigned from News International and its parent company. Later in July, it was alleged that News of the World hacked into the voicemail of Sarah Payne, mother of Sarah Payne, an eight-year-old girl who was murdered in July 2000 by Roy Whiting. Not only was the hacking unethical, but kind of two-faced of them too, considering how they had campaigned in favour of Sarah's law, which would allow parents to find out if a child's offender lived in the area. Sarah had written a column for the final News of the World issue in which she said that the staff, quote, supported me through some of the darkest, most difficult times of my life and became my trusted friends. After finding out her voicemail was hacked, she was apparently absolutely devastated and deeply disappointed. It has also been reported that relatives of British soldiers killed in action in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001, and relatives of victims of the July 2005 London bombings all had their phones hacked by News of the World. A total of around 3,000 people are thought to have had their phones hacked, but the number could be higher than 6,000. 
Public figures who it's thought were hacked include Paul McCartney, Elton John, Paul O'Grady, Angelina Jolie, Tony Blair, Noel Fielding, Sienna Miller, Jude Law, Sean Connery, Hugh Grant, Ulrika Johnson, Kerry Katona, Gary Lineker, Nigella Lawson, Joanna Lumley, Richard Medele, Ashley Cole, Gwyneth Paltrow, Brad Pitt, and Chris Tarrant, among many other celebrities, politicians, and members of or associates of the royal family. By mid-2012, 23 people had been arrested and 8 had been charged. Rebecca Brooks, News International Chief Executive and former News of the World Editor, Andy Colson, Editor, Stuart Kuttner, Managing Editor, Greg Miskew, News Desk Editor, all of whom had been arrested on suspicion of corruption and conspiring to intercept communications. Ian Edmondson, editor, Neville Thurlback, chief reporter, and James Weatherup, news editor, allegedly conspired to intercept communications and unlawfully intercepted voicemail messages. Glenn Mulcair, who had been convicted in relation to the royal phone hacking, was sentenced to six months in prison, suspended for 12 months, and made to do 200 hours community service. Andy Coulson was sentenced to 18 months in prison, while Rebecca Brooks, who it was revealed had an affair with Andy for roughly the duration of the scandal, was acquitted of all charges. Stuart Kutner was found not guilty, Greg Miskew and Neville Thurlback both pled guilty and were each sentenced to six months in prison. Ian Edmondson was sentenced to 18 months, and James Weatherup pled guilty and received a suspended sentence and 200 hours community service. Clive Goodman, who had been convicted for his involvement in the royal phone hacking, was arrested on suspicion of corruption, but later found not guilty of all charges. During Operation Wheating, investigators found evidence to suggest that some police personnel accepted inappropriate payments from news organisations in return for classified information, and so Operation Elverdon was launched. Convictions that resulted include April Casburn, a detective chief inspector and one of the Met's most senior counter-terrorism officers, who was found guilty of offering to sell inside information on the phone hacking probe to News of the World and sentenced to 15 months in prison. Paul Flatley, a police officer who pled guilty to conspiring to commit misconduct in public office. Scott Chapman, a police officer, and his partner Lynn Gaffner, found guilty of the same offence after being paid up to £40,000 for information about John Venables, who murdered two-year-old James Bulger when he was 10 with a friend of the same age. An unnamed News of the World journalist who paid Scott for that information, Timothy Edwards, an anti-terrorism police officer who pled guilty to misconduct in a public office, Anthony Franz, a reporter for The Sun, who was found guilty of aiding and abetting misconduct in a public office after paying Timothy over £22,000 for information, and Simon Quinn, a former police officer who was found guilty of leaking information about murder inquiries to journalists, including information about Millie Dowler. Four journalists who worked for The Sun were acquitted, including John Kay, who argued his contact with two military sources had been in the public interest and incidentally was convicted of manslaughter in 1977 after drowning his wife in the bath and passing it off as a nervous breakdown. He was admitted to a psychiatric facility, then rehired by The Sun when he was allowed out. Anyway, Operation Elvedon resulted in a total of 34 convictions, including nine police officers and two journalists. News of the World was obviously hit hardest by the scandal and was the only paper to have closed as a result. Hardly surprising considering it appeared that everyone who worked there knew what was going on, as did some police officers who abused their position and seemingly helped cover it up. Staff of other papers were up to the same tricks though, including The Sun, News of the World's sister paper, also owned by Rupert Murdoch. Following the closure of News of the World, it was rumoured that a Sunday issue of The Sun would replace it, and sure enough, The Sun on Sunday was launched in February 2012, with some journalists from the former getting hired to work for the latter. The Sun was founded in 1964 and became a tabloid when it was purchased by Rupert five years later. Before it was succeeded by Metro in 2018, it had the largest circulation of any daily newspaper in the UK. Just like News of the World, it's faced much criticism over the years. Here's a brief and far from complete history of the many controversies. In 1985, one of the headlines read, I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. 
Beginning in February 1987, The Sun published multiple false stories about Elton John, one being that he had his dog's voice boxes surgically removed. In May, they offered free one-way plane tickets to Norway for gay men to permanently leave the country under the headline, Fly Away Gays and We Will Pay. Later that year, a story about poet Benjamin Zephaniah was titled, Would You Let This Man Near Your Daughter? and said, quote, He is black, and later, he looks like he could do with a shampoo and a scrub. In November 1989, one of their headlines read, Straight cannot give you AIDS, official, having already termed the virus the US gay blood plague six years earlier. It was claimed, quote, the risk of catching AIDS if you are heterosexual is statistically invisible, in other words, impossible. Not only would that have undoubtedly contributed to the homophobia that surrounded AIDS, but their claim factually wasn't true, and it's entirely possible that readers could have contracted AIDS after reading that, lulled into a false sense of security because they were straight. In April 1989, 97 people were killed and 766 injured in the Hillsborough disaster, a human crush which occurred during a football match at Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield. South Yorkshire police alleged that the incident was caused by Liverpool supporters, who they claimed were drunk and rioting, though it was later concluded that the main cause was poor crowd control by the police. Three days after the disaster, it was falsely reported on the front page of The Sun that some Liverpool fans had pickpocketed victims, urinated on police officers, and beat up an officer who was trying to save someone's life. They claimed that police had been scapegoated and that thousands of fans, many without tickets, had tried to force their way into the stadium, some even blackmailing police. Obviously this turned out not to be the case, but it took years for The Sun to eventually recant their claims and apologise, at which time the managing editor admitted it was, quote, the worst mistake in our history. Many people and businesses in Liverpool boycott the paper to this day because of its coverage of the disaster. Throughout the 80s and 90s, numerous headlines referred to French people as frogs and Germans as krauts or hun. In July 2003, an article claimed that asylum seekers were slaughtering and eating swans, a totally fabricated story. In 2012, the Sun posted photos of Prince Harry naked that were taken while he was in a hotel room on holiday with friends in Las Vegas. Other British newspapers decided against doing so to protect his privacy because there was no public interest, yet the Sun claimed they were testing perception of freedom of the press. In June 2013, undercover reporter Maza Mahmood, who previously worked for News of the World and was involved in the fabricated Victoria Beckham kidnapping plot before getting hired at The Sun on Sunday, wrote a story with the headline, Talisa's Cocaine Deal Shame. At the trial the following year, the judge said that there were strong grounds to believe that Marza had lied and tried to manipulate evidence against Julissa, a singer. In 2015, columnist Katie Hopkins referred to migrants to Britain as cockroaches and feral humans and said they were spreading like the norovirus. In 2017, Trevor Kavanagh wrote an article for the paper that questioned what actions British society should take to deal with, quote, the Muslim problem, which was compared to the use of the phrase, the Jewish problem, prior to the Holocaust. In 2018, The Sun criticised 17-year-old Emmerdale actress Isabel Steele for covering up from head to toe and said she should, quote, flash a bit of flesh. In 2019, rugby player Gareth Thomas revealed that a journalist, who he didn't identify by name or newspaper they worked for, told his parents that he had HIV before he had a chance to himself, and it's speculated that the paper was The Sun, though not confirmed. In 2020, J.K. Rowling described her first marriage as violent, which led to The Sun interviewing her ex-husband and publishing a front-page story with the headline, I slapped J.K. and I'm not sorry. The Sun eventually apologised for most of these incidents, but it was usually seen as too little or too late, as it was only when their views had been poorly received at the time, or years later when they were finally called out, that they decided to backtrack. Anyway, let's briefly jump back to the News of the World scandal. As part of the investigations, 31 employees of The Sun had been arrested by the end of February 2012. The Leveson Inquiry had been probing the culture, practices and ethics of the British press since July 2011, and in February the following year, Sue Akers, Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, told the inquiry that they were investigating a, quote, network of corrupt officials, and that they had found evidence to suggest that there was a, quote, 
culture of illegal payments at the Sun authorised at a senior level. In the aftermath of the revelations, six senior staff and journalists, sometimes known as the Sun Six, were put on trial in October 2014, each charged with conspiring to commit misconduct in a public office after they had allegedly made illegal payments to public officials like police, prison officers and soldiers on numerous occasions. In January 2015, former reporter John Throop and picture editor John Edwards were acquitted. Deputy news editor Ben O'Driscoll and former managing editor Graham Dudman were partially cleared. A few days later, it became apparent that the jury weren't going to be able to reach a unanimous verdict on Ben and Graham's remaining charges, plus head of news Chris Farrow and district reporter Jamie Pyatt's charges. After a juror was discharged and the judge stated he would accept majority verdicts of 11 to 0 or 10 to 1, the jury was still unable to reach a decision and so a retrial was announced. Anyway, during the initial trial, Ben O'Driscoll, who denied three counts of conspiring, spoke about a huge safe full of information that the Sun had decided not to publicise. Quote, it was an enormous safe, seven foot high. It looks like something out of the Wild West. And that safe is full of about 30 years of stories which are confidential and did not pass the public interest test. What's in there is quite eye-popping, I must say. It would be photographs, videos, reports. Ordinarily, it would involve MPs, celebrities. There are royals in there. If you were to publish everything in that safe, the sun's circulation would go up. If we've learnt one thing so far, it's that the Sun will publish almost anything. They don't even care if it's true or not, as long as it gets people buying the paper. To solidify this even more, one of its best known headlines in March 1986 was Freddy Star Ate My Hamster, and the story alleged that he had eaten his partner's hamster in a sandwich because there was no food in the house. The story was totally fabricated by his partner, though it seems that the Sun were aware of that and published it anyway, because sales. In 2019, Will Haggerty wrote an article to celebrate 50 years of the sun in which he spoke about the hamster story. Quote, this episode encapsulates the unique humour which has defined the sun since its launch 50 years ago. A minor story plucked from nowhere, bestowed with a blockbuster headline which turned it into a national talking point, then a follow-up stunt that amplified the impact in an era long before social media. A minor story plucked from nowhere. I guess that's one way of blatantly admitting to fabricating it. Ben O'Driscoll said the information in the safe didn't pass the public interest test, but I'm not sure how many of their other stories did either. In addition to some of the controversies already covered, many of the stories were just mindless celebrity gossip. For example, about Michael Jackson sleeping in an oxygen tank, calling him Wacko Jacko. They even to this day have a section on the website for wardrobe malfunctions showing various celebrities whose shirts have fallen down or their skirts have blown up. The majority of these are women. How is any of that in the public interest? They've proven time and time again that they don't care for facts and they certainly don't care for feelings. So what is in that safe that even the Sun won't publish? There is some information that allows us to make somewhat of an educated guess. On the 18th of July 2015, the front page of The Sun showed a still from a quote, secret 1933 film that shows Edward VIII teaching this Nazi salute to the Queen. For context, Edward briefly became the king in 1936 for less than a year because he wanted to marry a woman who had been divorced, and after they married and became Duke and Duchess of Windsor in October 1937, they visited Germany and met with Hitler to discuss an international movement for peace on his terms. This led to numerous accusations that he was a Nazi sympathiser, though some historians believe he was simply trying to keep the peace. So who knows what his intentions were. But regardless, the Queen was seven years old in that video, she obviously didn't know what that gesture meant, and it was years before the war anyway, so most of Hitler's actions were not widespread knowledge at that point. Peter Dukes covered the Sun's safe, also dubbed the Black Museum, in an article and said that according to sources, the photos of the Queen doing the salute were kept in the safe for many years before they decided to release them. It's not clear why they were released. Perhaps some of the contents of the safe have been saved for a rainy day when nothing else is going on. There's not much significance in those photos, yet it sure makes for an eye-catching headline. 
From this, we can surmise that there are probably other compromising photos, videos and information about the royal family. Some have speculated naked photos, but the Sun already printed those photos of Prince Harry taken in a hotel room, which was already pushing the boundaries. Did they use even less ethical methods to obtain other inappropriate images? Rumour has it that there is evidence of celebrities engaging in inappropriate acts with animals, but surely that's exactly the kind of story the Sun would issue. Perhaps they were threatened with legal action, but lawyers of the royal family did that prior to the Prince Harry photos being leaked and that didn't stop them. Regardless, that kind of contact with animals is illegal, so I don't think anyone engaging in such activity would have a leg to stand on in court. You can let your mind run wild with theories of what the safe might contain, but for most of that potential information, I can't understand why they wouldn't publish it, unless they're using it for blackmail purposes. This is total speculation on my part, but it makes sense. If they have dirt on public figures, enough to damage their reputations, but not necessarily anything illegal, like celebrities having affairs, they could probably blackmail them for other information they might have. Why out one celebrity for cheating on the wife when they could give you information about six other celebrities doing the same thing, or engaging in other, possibly even worse activities? It's interesting that The Sun sometimes won't reveal how they obtain certain information, like the aforementioned photos of the Queen, and if they weren't paying for such content, it makes sense that they had something on whoever gave them it. Why else would they even keep a safe full of stories if they decided they weren't in the public interest and they weren't going to publish them? The safe could basically be The Sun's burn book, though with information a bit more mature than Amber D'Alessio made out with a hot dog. It seems unlikely that the safe is filled with celebrity misdemeanours alone though, and it may actually contain evidence of serious crimes. According to Peter Dukes, when Rebecca Brooks became the first female editor for The Sun in 2003, she would openly talk with her friends about the safe and some of the scandals it contained, quote, Sources describe the names she mentioned as U-Tree type material. U-Tree presumably refers to Operation U-Tree, an investigation into various abuse allegations, mostly the abuse of children, by Jimmy Savile, Rolf Harris and other notorious individuals. It can't be argued that releasing evidence of such criminal activity wouldn't be in the public interest, and so you have to question what hands are in which pockets for that to potentially be covered up. Former News of the World journalist Graham Johnson wrote a book titled Hack, which was described as, quote, a compelling and intoxicating story of one man's time in the tabloid jungle. In said book, he claimed that News International had deliberately suppressed evidence that author Arthur C. Clarke had inappropriate contact with children. Sri Lankan authorities apparently cleared him of the allegations shortly before his death, seemingly due to a lack of evidence, though there seems to be some contention over his innocence, and the Sunday Mirror reported that he had confessed to paying young boys to have inappropriate contact with him. He later denied that he was a p but never sued the paper for defamation. Graham Johnson told The Independent, Roger Insall said that because Arthur C. Clarke was a mate of Rupert Murdoch, the editor wasn't having any of it, and despite Roger getting a lot of evidence that Clarke was a p they wouldn't publish it. When asked about the story, Phil Hall, editor at the time, vaguely disputed this, saying, I can vaguely remember that story. I do remember that Roger Insall worked on it, and I remember it was not published. My only recollection is that the only reason we wouldn't publish it was because of legal reasons. Whether or not Arthur Clarke was innocent is somewhat irrelevant, as no one could have known at the time, so if Graham is telling the truth, it's highly unethical that Rupert Murdoch may have suppressed evidence that could have outed Arthur, and therefore potentially saved children from abuse, because they were pals. I'll leave you to make your own mind up on that one, as I can't confirm the validity of Graham or Phil's claims. If such evidence existed though, it's possibly one of the many scandals that would be uncovered if the contents of the safe were ever leaked. Interestingly, this is not the only time that Rupert's papers have been accused of covering up similar behaviour because he was friends with the accused. Soon after the death of Cyril Smith, a member of the Liberal Democrats and MP for Rochdale between 1972 and 1992, it was revealed that he had inappropriate contact with a number of underage boys. The Rochdale Alternative Press had covered some of the earlier allegations in 1979, though it was a small local paper, and a short-lived police investigation did not lead to a conviction, even though he had been discovered to be in possession of CP in the 1980s. 
According to the BBC, he was released after a few hours in custody. The evidence was destroyed and officers on the case were not allowed to discuss it further. When one officer found Cyril in the home of a known offender with two drunk teenage boys and a police sergeant in plain clothes, he was made to attend a meeting with a senior officer and told in no uncertain terms not to talk about what he'd seen. Margaret Thatcher, former Prime Minister, was aware of the allegations and yet Cyril was still knighted in 1988. All this suggested that a cover-up was indubitable, but was the Sun or News International involved? According to the Daily Mail, there was a burglary at the Sun's Fleet Street offices in 1982 in which a copy of the police file on Cyril was found, leading to speculation that the break-in was linked to attempts to cover up the crimes. If this is true, it sounds like there's a good chance that this is where the seven-foot safe is located, but more to the point, it begs the question, why on earth did the Sun not publish this? It was a much bigger paper than the Rochdale Alternative Press, so had it reported on the story when the police file was first received, the public would have known about the crimes and Cyril may have even been prosecuted. Instead, he died, having faced no consequences despite shamelessly admitting to some of the allegations. It's sounding increasingly likely that the contents of the safe, if ever publicised, would not only damage reputations but could potentially result in criminal investigations that never happened before due to cover-ups. That said, it's important to note that the existence of the safe hasn't been definitively proven, nor has its potential contents. I'd be willing to bet that The Sun and other newspapers have a plethora of juicy stories that they never published and the claim of a seven foot high safe containing 30 years worth of information does seem pointlessly specific if it's not true. Rupert Murdoch apparently used to brag about having dirt on people. According to Michael Wolfe, who wrote a biography about him, Murdoch, a gossip hound, often announced during our conversations that he had damaging pictures of this or that enemy. However, when Peter Dukes asked him to elaborate, he said, He said this multiple times, Wolf explained, with demonic chuckle, we have pictures. But when I asked him about this, it seemed more like he had been told we have pictures. And I got the feeling he was often told we have pictures without there necessarily being pictures. Various people at various papers would say to me, he thinks we have pictures, and then they would chuckle too. Most of the behaviour at News Corp was geared to keeping the old man happy, and if that involved him believing they ran a sophisticated intelligence operation, so be it, even if they were not so sophisticated and not so intelligent. If such a safe ever did exist, it's possible that it has since been destroyed. Ben O'Driscoll stopped working for The Sun in 2011, meaning according to him, the stories, photos and videos in the safe date back to the early 80s. That was over 10 years ago now though, and there's every chance that the contents of the safe were discarded after the phone hacking scandal or around the time of the Sun 6 trial, especially if some of that information was obtained through illegal means. The Sun 6 were all eventually cleared of the charges, and it makes sense that other employees wouldn't want to risk a trial themselves if word got out about the safe. I don't doubt The Sun and other newspapers still have stories they chose not to publish, but I'm not sure keeping them in a huge safe would be the wisest decision. A warrant to search it could be obtained in certain situations, and one of the offices has been burglarised in the past. Whether it exists or existed or not, it's highly unlikely that all of its hypothetical contents would ever be released to the public as there must be a reason it hasn't been already. Perhaps when certain people die and there's no longer a reason to protect certain shady individuals, or if, for whatever reason, an argument can be made that some of the stories are in the public interest, we might one day get to hear them, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. In 2003, 36-year-old Maury Travis was arrested on suspicion of murdering multiple people. Police searched his home and found a hidden torture chamber in the basement, which contained body equipment, a stun gun, newspaper clippings about the murders he was suspected of, and crucially, various tapes, including one that showed him committing some of the crimes. The tape was titled, Your Wedding Day, and showed Maori torturing different women and killing one of them. Many, if not all of these women were sex workers and addicted to drugs, which Maori used to his advantage. He didn't kill every woman he brought home, some he just had sex with and gave them drugs then let them go. Sometimes he would get them to do strange things, such as dancing in white clothes or wearing sunglasses with opaque lenses so they couldn't see. 
the women that weren't lucky enough to be let go were tied up and assaulted in various ways, while Maru would taunt and degrade them. Following his arrest, he was placed in a maximum security jail cell and had a guard outside his door, however he still somehow managed to take his own life. He previously bragged about having 17 victims, and police have only identified 12, but believe there could be many more. It seems that a video clip from the tape might have made its way online a few years ago. There was a Reddit post that linked to a video titled, Footage Filmed by Maori Travis Torturing One of His Victims, though it now just comes up with a 404 page, and archives show that there was a video by that title, but don't allow you to play it. So I can't vouch for the validity of that video, but whether or not it really was footage of Maori's, the full tape doesn't appear to be available online now. Pseudoscorpion is the title given to quite possibly the most disturbing album of all time. It seems that the album doesn't actually feature any music, just various audio clips from CP. The last track includes audio from Daisy's Destruction. There is somewhat of a storyline, albeit a vile one, basically about a little girl becoming a slave. Things escalate throughout until she is tortured towards the end. The man behind the album seems to be quite an elusive character, for obvious reasons. There's much speculation, but next to no information is known for sure about him. It was rumoured that he was arrested in 2017, after he seemingly vanished from the internet, but there's no evidence to suggest that's true. It seems that Pseudoscorpion originated on the dark web, and made its way to the clear net via 4chan, unsurprisingly. It was allegedly shared on Reddit and other social media too, but is now nowhere to be found. 4chan threads discussing it were deleted, archives were also removed, and honestly I think that's for the best. I highly advise against trying to find this album. This stuff isn't even grim in an interesting way, it's just straight up disgusting. Regardless, seeing as it is literally classed as CP, it's illegal to possess. In 1994, a man named Pero Loco started the Cannibal Cafe on necrobabes.org, a website dedicated to various festivals relating to death. The Cannibal Cafe itself was basically a bunch of people who fantasised about eating someone or being eaten by someone. Pero Loco is a pseudonym, but his real name has been identified and he has done an interview with a journalist in the past as well as briefly appearing in an episode of Encounters with Evil in 2016, where he highlighted that cannibalism fantasies aren't as uncommon as you think. Pero has been referred to as a cult leader and supposedly founded the Holy Church of Dolset, Dolset being defined as a paraphilia involving the cooking and eating of women. There's barely any mention of the Church of Dolset online, and while he clearly had a number of followers, some of whom did speak of him as if he was of elevated status, it sounds like the cult claims are slightly exaggerated, and that the so-called church was just a bunch of people who all shared cannibalism as a common interest. Perro has links to two different homicide cases, but we'll get back to that later. He has said himself, and I found one database website which appears to corroborate that he has a medical background, though I'm not sure what in specifically. There are three separate FAQ pages where he wrote very detailed answers relating to how to impale a woman without killing her, and I mean very detailed, like he'd spent a significant amount of time planning every tiny aspect of it, maybe even like he'd done it before. From these and other posts, he does appear to have some level of medical knowledge, I just hope to god he wasn't around any patients. While he clearly had some questionable interests, he portrayed himself as an advocate for consent, and made it clear on the forum that it was only for consenting adults condemning any posts involving children. Contrary to popular belief, the Cannibal Cafe was not a dark web forum and could be accessed by anyone on the clear net. Let's take a look at some of the archives of the forum. As you can see, the layout is an absolute train wreck. It's painful to navigate and not all of the posts themselves have been archived, though there is enough to build a picture of what the forum was like. There are a range of posts, from people looking for a willing victim to people offering themselves up. People shared recipes and cooking tips on how to cook human meat perfectly. I picked a selection of posts which encapsulate the nature of the forum. One read, Hello, I am a Canadian male looking for a female under 30 if possible to be able to meet and eat. I feel that the female should be given the choice as to how the process is going to go, so if you are an interested applicant, please describe in detail as to how you would like me to prepare you. 
The selected person will be able to fly here and have their fantasy fulfilled. If you reply, you can push your answer to the forum or feel free to email me directly. I look forward to eating you soon. This one read, I am a very dangerous man to get to know. I can lift five 140 pound girls and carry them for miles, squeezing them hard enough to crush their puny little spine like a toothpick. I fear no one. I will and can eat any girl I wish to. You might never know. I might be stalking you at this very moment. It seems quite common to refer to human meat the same as animal meat, even using terminology like cattle and veal. This post read, I'm looking for packaged meat, breeders and cattle. How can I obtain these, especially female redheads? Another post was from a user named Alan who was offering himself up to be eaten. He said he would like to quietly disappear without a trace and begs whoever might accept his offer to keep him naked, chained and caged while he awaits slaughter. He stresses that this is for real and says he will hand over all of his money to make it worth the while. And finally, this one is basically an invitation to a barbecue party where you can eat OP's ex-girlfriend. They say they plan to slaughter their ex-girlfriend in six to seven months and ask for suggestions on the preparation of the meat. As disturbing as these posts are, it's probably safe to assume that the majority of users were just role-playing. Some did specify that. And to most people, it is a pretty sickening fantasy, but hey, consenting adults and all that. Thing is, they weren't all role-playing, and some were deadly serious, pun not intended. You may have heard of Armin Mywares, a man who was arrested in 2004 for killing and eating someone. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the murder itself, as there are so many videos and articles online if you're interested, but Armin actually frequented the cafe, and some of his posts can still be seen using the Wayback Machine. He went by the name of Frankie and made a number of posts and commented on other posts discussing cannibalism in general and attempting to find a man that would consent to being eaten. They had to be between 18 and 30 years old, normal build. Many users on the cafe seemed to like the idea of cannibalism and enjoyed the role playing but probably wouldn't actually go through with it in real life. Nevertheless, he eventually found someone, Bernd Brandes, who consented to being eaten. He didn't exactly fit Armin's specifications, but I guess cannibals requiring consent in victims can't be choosers. According to some sources, despite Armin's ads on the cafe, he and Burned didn't actually meet on there, but another website which featured similar content. The story is bizarre and horrifying, but it leads into an interesting debate surrounding the morality of consensual murder. There are fair points on both sides of the argument, but I guess what it really boils down to is, is someone actually capable of consenting to their own murder? Fetishes surrounding murder and cannibalism are certainly abnormal, but I guess it's not exactly a choice. But to actually act out something like that, to consent to someone killing and eating you is just totally irrational. Can someone considering that ever really be in the right state of mind to consent to it? If you think no, I'm curious, as a hypothetical, if someone was evaluated by a psychiatrist and determined to not be mentally ill, would it then be morally acceptable? Let's also say that they have no family, no friends, no one who depends on them and no one who would miss them if they were gone. Arguably, if they really wanted to die and their death would affect no one else and they were determined to be 100% sane, perhaps they should have the right to consent to their own murder if that's really the way that they want to go. I'd be really interested to hear what you think in the comments though as it's a very complex debate and I'm not exactly sure where I stand on it. Unsurprisingly, Perro found no issue with it, telling the all.com, everything he did, he did completely consensually. It's not like the guy was a serial killer. He didn't sit there and invite Jurgen over for dinner and sneak up behind him. They discussed it. Jurgen wanted to be killed and eaten. To me, that's assisted suicide at worst. Amin's arrest, which occurred over a year after he killed Burned, is what led to the end of the Cannibal Cafe. That same article goes on to mention how Perro was also implicated in another case of consensual homicide, where 35-year-old Sharon Lepatka searched on the internet for a man to torture, strangle and kill her. She found someone and it happened, and Perro knew them both, describing them as very nice people. After the cafe was shut down in 2002, Perro created a new website in 2003, Dolset Girls, dedicated to, quote, covering a full range of graphic. He claimed the site got over a million hits every month from men and women more or less equally and that at least one user was a US congressman. I think and hope that fetishes like this are still pretty rare but it seems to be a lot more common than you'd think. 
It appears that enacting this fantasy once wasn't enough for Armin, as he made numerous posts on the cafe in the months after the murder, requesting another volunteer. He also commented on other posts made by people who wanted to be eaten, such as one titled, Please Eat Me, by an 18-year-old man, to which he responded, Hi, I am Frankie from Germany, I will eat you. Please tell me your height and weight, also send me a pic from you. Where are you from? I hope you can come quick to me, I am a hungry cannibal. I don't know what's more unsettling, his adverts or some of his other interactions. In response to a post titled, Extreme Butcher Wanted, which isn't archived but we can take an educated guess on the nature of the post, he responded, Hi Hansel, being fried alive, that's certainly a nice idea, especially for you as a victim, but keep in mind that at your weight, there are about 35 kilograms of meat on you, so if every cannibal at the meal would eat about 500 grams of meat from you, that's a very large portion, you need about 70 people to eat you. After all, none of your delicious meat should remain and spoil. It will be quite difficult to drum up such a large number of eaters, so if you decide to slaughter and disassemble, quote, normally, please contact me. I will expertly slaughter and disassemble you, and also eat you completely with other cannibal friends. I look forward to your answer, your butcher. It makes me wonder if Burned was Armin's only victim, or if that was just the time that he got caught. He was pretty open and honest when he got arrested, and has even done interviews since. Knowing that he's likely going to be in prison for the rest of his life, he probably would have admitted it if he had more victims. But who knows, he certainly wanted to do it again, it just depends on whether or not anyone else seriously volunteered. Regardless of Armin, I'd be willing to bet that the Cannibal Cafe, or at least other similar websites, have facilitated the arrangement of other consensual cannibalism cases. Armin was debatably not very smart after the murder, he filmed the whole thing and posted it online. That's a pretty daft thing to do if you don't want to get caught, so I wonder how many other cannibals privately responded to serious ads from people who wanted to be eaten, went through with it, then never got caught and just never spoke about it again. The video itself is thought to be lost media, though you can find a couple of screenshots online that are allegedly supposed to be from the video, but it's not been confirmed. Look those up at your own risk though, because they are very graphic. As we already established, a good chunk of the cafe's users probably liked the idea of cannibalism more than they would actually like to go through with it, but I seriously doubt that Burned was the only person who was serious about being eaten. It is still hard to separate out posts from people who were very dedicated to the role-playing, but some of them seemed pretty serious. They spoke about each detail as if they had experience with it, if it was just role-playing, it was extremely well-researched and believable. So many of the posts specified that they were not role-playing, or emphasised that they wanted to do these things in real life, which makes me wonder if they were serious, because if it was just role-playing, why would they need to stress how serious they were? Surely everyone would just roll with it as if it was real and not find the need to specify how serious it was. Up until now, we've only really looked at the consensual side of all this, and that's dark enough, but the Cannibal Cafe had a whole section titled Available Livestock, which may not have been quite so consensual. A short paragraph read, We will soon have an online order form, where consumers will be able to arrange to purchase or lease C&M HFSA livestock. Remember that there is no limitation on the intended or actual use of any of our cows, but should any leased livestock be terminated during the lease period, you will be invoiced for the full purchase price. The section featured adverts with photos of women and short descriptions such as this one. Cal Stephanie's training is almost complete. She will soon be auctioned off as a snuff slave or butchered for her meat. Her termination options include, but are not limited to, total dehumanisation, extreme torture, hanging, asphyxiation, vivisection, live butchering, impalement and ritual slaughter. The LTP Livestock Counselors have recommended that she be given a starring role in a snuff video. Stephanie needs an owner. Stephanie actually posted in the forum a few times, but of course we have no way of knowing if she was the woman in the photo. One of the women featured is supposedly Perro's daughter, and the description includes, always willing to put his money where his mouth is, C&M HFSA Chairman Perro Loco accepted his daughter Chelsea's livestock application. Chelsea Loco is currently enrolled in the livestock training program and is being trained by our expert livestock counsellors. Apparently she hopes to eventually star in her very own snuff video. 
While Chelsea and other women were categorised as voluntary, some were categorised as involuntary. Take Ashley, for example, who has been, quote, donated on an involuntary basis by her ex-boyfriend, who recommended that she be used as a breeder. This is really just all kinds of messed up, and what's worse is some of the posts written about these women. In this post, a user goes into worrying detail on how they would eat Ashley and requests a price for her, suggesting $3,500, and adding that they'd be happy to sell copies of the video they make of their time together. Despite Perro claiming the site is strictly focused on consenting adults, there are posts where he and others talk about using women for breeding, implying that the babies would be sold for meat. There are other posts which focus on children, such as this one which reads, I'm looking for young boy meat, 6 to 16, any volunteer mothers out there looking to give up meat, call me. There was even a livestock application form where you could volunteer yourself or nominate someone else. There is an option of voluntary or involuntary, further suggesting that if any of this was real, consent clearly wasn't as important as Perro would want you to think. I hope to god this is just extreme role-playing between consenting adults, but some of the posts are really worrying and convincing. It makes you wonder if the consenting adults thing is just a disclaimer. And even if it is mostly role-playing, it's inevitable that some people won't be able to totally detach from the mindset that is condoned and encouraged here. I tried searching some of the names from the adverts online, but didn't really find anything relevant. I also tried searching some of the images to see if they might have been taken from a different site, but there was only one image that came up with any results, and all of the results were after the Cannibal Cafe was shut down. It makes you wonder how these women ended up on there. Were any of them really voluntary? Even if these women haven't been kidnapped or trafficked or something, somehow I doubt that they consented to their photos being on this forum. If not, there are possible reasons real life ramifications, I wouldn't put it past some people to try and track these women down and attempt to act out the fantasies. The Cannibal Cafe is one of the most bizarre and concerning rabbit holes I've researched. I don't know how much of it is real and how much is people taking role playing to the absolute extreme, but I'm in my words is proof that the line between fantasy and reality was definitely blurred. This wasn't the only forum of its kind, and even today there are communities focusing on cannibalism and other horrifying the Cannibal Cafe may have stopped serving nearly 20 years ago now, but its customers certainly didn't lose their taste for blood. Mark L. Rosen was a film producer and representative who worked on many horror movies, including Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Hell Night, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 1974. In 2008, he featured in Snuff, a documentary about killing on camera, which explores the urban myth of the snuff film, a film where someone is actually killed for the purpose of the movie, which is then sold for financial gain. There are many instances of someone getting murdered on camera, some of which we've already discussed, but not necessarily for the purpose of filming it and selling the footage. There are many rumours of these films existing, and it makes sense that someone, somewhere, has created one at some point, but no confirmed examples are widely known of. Anyway, in the documentary, Mark claimed that in the early days of his career, when his job was to assess various adult films for potential distribution, he was contacted by a man from the Philippines who had made a very violent adult movie, which ended with a character getting murdered. The man had described the movie as unique, hard to acquire, and unlike anything he had ever seen. Mark was, at the time of watching, and still is convinced that what he saw was real, and that the woman was actually murdered. The camera zooms in to show the wound on her neck, and Mark claims that it looked far too realistic for it to be special effects. The movie he described has never been found, and some question the validity of the story. It's possible that he made it up for the purpose of the documentary, or that he was wrong about it being real, and it was just really good special effects. Mac was visibly distressed when describing the content of the film. He could have just been acting, but assuming he's telling the truth, it does seem like he at least really believes it was real. Yellowstone National Park spans an area of 3,468 square miles, and is known for its wildlife and scenery, comprised of lakes, canyons, rivers, and mountain ranges. In June 2016, 
23-year-old Colin Scott and his sister Sable were hiking through a prohibited section of the park, searching for a hot spring to illegally swim in. They eventually found one, and as Colin bent down to check the temperature, he fell right into it. Sable attempted to save him, but there wasn't really much he could do. He was in extremely hot and highly acidic water. She ran back to get help, but he was already dead at that point, and his body was unable to be recovered at that time due to a lightning storm. When park officials returned the next morning, all that was retrieved was Colin's wallet and flip-flops, and everything else, including his body, had totally dissolved. Colin wasn't the first person to end up in one of these hot springs. In 1981, 24-year-old David Kerwan dived into one of the pools to save his friend's dog. His friend managed to drag him out of the pool, and he made it to the hospital, but the damage was already done, and sadly, neither he or the dog survived. Colin's death might be one of the only incidents of that nature that was caught on camera, though the footage has never been publicised. In 2006, a movie was filmed showing the assault of a teenage girl with a developmental disability. I wish I could say it was fiction, but everything we're about to cover in this video rarely happened, and it's horrific. In June 2006, a group of 12 boys aged between 15 and 17 decided to make a movie in Werribee, a suburb of Melbourne, Victoria, in Australia. They started out doing stunts and minor pranks, the kind of stuff you'd see on Jackass. In fact, that comparison has been made enough that Johnny Knoxville responded to the suggestion that the movie was inspired by Jackass, saying, We're not mean-spirited, we're not evil, shoot those little bastards. What starts out as bike stunts escalates to the boys egging taxis and even throwing eggs in people's faces. A taxi driver featured in the local newspaper after his car was egged and it wasn't until the DVD was released that the culprits became known. They were so proud of their mischief that they included a photo of the newspaper article alongside the footage of them doing it. They also filmed fights between students to include in the movie. The DVD then shows the boys and various other youths at a party in a house that looks like it's ready to be demolished. They can be seen kicking through walls and one of the girls kicks through a window and cuts her foot. The police eventually show up, though it doesn't sound like they did anything more than tell the group to move on. Next, they are shown making chlorine bombs and seemingly trying to blow things up. For reasons that will soon become clear, most of the footage is not publicly available as far as I'm aware, and there are only a few clips which were included in a segment on the movie by Today Tonight. As a result, it's not totally clear what's happening at times, but it looks like the group is trying to blow things up, and you can see something has been set on fire. The group's behaviour continues to spiral when they come across a homeless man sleeping under some steps and decide to drop a flare on him. The man can be heard shouting, clearly startled, but this doesn't deter the boys who drop another flare on him. The worst part of the movie, though, involved a 17-year-old girl who has been described as developmentally delayed. She was only referred to as the victim in the movie, and it doesn't sound like she has been publicly named at all. The boys start out humiliating the girl, pointing and laughing at her and shouting, the victim. One boy approaches the camera and says, what the f*** is the ugliest thing I've ever seen? It looks like the girl is trying to walk away, but the boys surround her in a threatening way, chanting and clapping before sexually assaulting her, setting her hair on fire and throwing urine on her. The movie includes a warning that reads, Some of the stuff about to be shown isn't pleasant. CTM has warned you. The victim has no problem with what is about to be shown. She slash he, we don't know what, took it all as a joke. The only shred of truth in that is that it wasn't pleasant, to say the least, but this poor girl did not consent to what happened to her, let alone to being filmed and the footage being made into a DVD. It said that the footage was edited to make it look like she consented, but she has since made it clear that she did not. She was apparently traumatised and humiliated after suffering such cruel abuse at the hands of these unprincipled boys. As if their actions weren't bad enough, what made it so much worse is the lack of remorse, and the fact that they seemed so proud of their behaviour, and the DVD that was subsequently produced. The fact that it was even produced and released to begin with shows that, and not only did they make no effort to cover or blur their faces, but some of the boys even put their real names in the credits. They literally just did not give a shit. After they compiled all the clips, they advertised it online and sold it around their school for $5 a copy. It also made its way into at least two other schools. Some of the boys drove around Werribee, hanging out of the car window, asking if anyone wanted to buy the DVD. 
It's not clear if they told people what it featured before selling them it, or if they let them find out themselves. The front cover of the DVD read, The movie is brought to you by the teenage kings of Werribee. No one messes with us, we only mess with them. The boys allegedly posted clips from the movie on YouTube at some point in 2006. One of the videos was reportedly titled Pimp My Wife and was viewed over 2,500 times. YouTube took down the video on the 25th of October that year due to terms of use violation. A few days later, there were rumours that a sequel, CTM2, had been created, featuring some of the boys in the first movie breaking into houses, destroying property, and defecating into kettles and cups. Today Tonight first covered this story on the 23rd of October, before police had even seen or heard of the DVD. They gave police a copy of it and an investigation was launched. It was reported that the victim had been talking to two of the boys online and had arranged to meet them at a shopping centre in Werribee. When she arrived though, the group of 12 boys came to meet her, and it sounds like they either physically forced or somehow pressured her into going to the riverbank where she was assaulted. According to Overland.org, she knew some of the other boys and classed them as friends. If that is the case, it sounds like a few of them might have actually groomed her for an extended period of time, getting acquainted with her and gaining her trust before eventually torturing and humiliating her. The day after the Today Tonight broadcast, one of the boys who featured in the movie was expelled from Cardinia International College, where two other boys were also investigated for their possible involvement. The boy apparently didn't try to defend himself, and according to the principal, quote, knows he did a very, very silly thing, but I don't think he understood the full extent and the consequence of the stupid, horrid video. I really hope that guy just chose his words poorly there. Egging a taxi is a very, very silly thing. Sexually assaulting someone is one of the most depraved and unscrupulous things you could possibly do. The parents of the boys involved seem to have mixed reactions about the DVD. When Today Tonight contacted two of the boys' mothers, one said she thought it was just a bit of fun, and both said they were aware of the boys egging cars, attacking a homeless man, and assaulting the girl, and that they, quote, didn't approve. Parents of three of the boys involved contacted the police and asked that their sons be questioned as part of the investigation. It's good to hear at least some of them have morals. It wasn't until March the following year that eight of the boys in the movie were charged and later pled guilty to assault, manufacturing child pornography, and procuring by intimidation. The other four boys denied the charges and it sounds like they never faced any punishment. The boys who admitted their guilt didn't get taught much of a lesson, they just had to participate in a sexual offenders rehabilitation program. Seven of them had convictions recorded against them, six were placed on youth supervision orders for 12 to 18 months, and two were on probation for 12 months. While the incident may not be very well known around the world, I'd never heard of it until recently, it horrified people in Victoria. Many of them weren't totally unaware of the rising problem of youth gangs, but seeing such a cruel and senseless attack on camera made it so much more real. In a radio interview, Shane Bark, the mayor of Wyndham, said that the incident had been, quote, an eye-opener not just for our community, but for the rest of Australia. What these young people have done is disgusting and abhorrent. Child psychologist Dr John Cheatham said, It's the sort of behaviour you would expect in a prison camp. It's something like a flashback to the Second World War and the way the Jews were treated. Most would agree that the punishment the boys received wasn't even close to what they deserved. They were treated like children who had stolen sweets from the corner shop, barely given more than a slap on the wrist. In fact, some idiots even spoke out against harsher punishments, highlighting that they were still young and it would ruin their lives. Yet they were all 15 or older, not so young that they didn't know right from wrong, and they not only ruined a young girl's life, but laughed and bragged about it too. If there was any chance that they could reform, they'd need to face more serious consequences to know that their actions were wrong. Even then, I'm not sure there's much hope that they could come back from that, but their punishment, if you can even call it that, did nothing but teach them that they could more or less get away with such behaviour. All this happened 15 years ago and there doesn't appear to be any information online about what happened to the boys after their convictions, or what they're doing now. I doubt they became valuable members of society, but I'm sure they were probably given new names and a fresh start like nothing happened. It is known that in April 2009, one of the boys filmed himself and four other people who were not involved in the DVD rapping about the incident, bragging that he didn't get jailed, and showing that he clearly has no remorse for what he did. He posted the video, which refers to the victim by her first name, on his website and boasted that it had been viewed more than the 11 o'clock news. 
He not only brags about being violent and racist, but claims he will go on to commit more violence. As vile as this rap is, it's hardly surprising coming from someone who took pleasure out of torturing a young girl and didn't even get jail time for it. Despite the movie being sold on DVD shortly after the incident, and parts of it being uploaded to YouTube, perhaps the only remaining clips are on the two Today Tonight segments that can still be found on YouTube. They show the group performing bike stunts, egging cars and people, partying in and vandalising the abandoned house, making chlorine bombs, throwing flares on the homeless man, and certain parts of the attack on the girl. I assume most of the lost clips show more pranks that are irresponsible and careless, but nothing that makes you want to remove your eyeballs. The same can't be said for the footage of the girl. The parts shown on Today Tonight were bad enough, so the rest comfortably fits into the category of lost media that doesn't need to be found ever. Seeing as it's literally classed as child po it's illegal, so the chances of finding it on the clear net at least are relatively slim. It was recommended at the time that anyone who bought the DVD not only avoid sharing it, but destroy it, and there was talk of CP charges if anyone was caught with it. Unfortunately, I'm sure someone out there still has a copy, and who knows if it has since been distributed, maybe on the dark web. I'm guessing a copy also might have been stored by the police with other evidence relevant to the case, so it's unlikely that the DVD is totally lost, but most of it can't be viewed by the public. I can't even imagine how the victim must have felt knowing that anyone saw her assault to begin with. Perhaps it'd be worth it if the boys actually faced harsh enough consequences, but considering most of them got off with not much more than a slap on the wrist, it really was a final kick in the teeth for her that so many people witnessed that footage. I can only hope she found a way to move on from what happened eventually. I mentioned Daisy's destruction in relation to Pseudo Scorpion, as audio from it was used in the last track on the album. The existence of the video has been confirmed, but I've seen slightly varying accounts on what it features. The most common summary is that there were three young girls, one of whom only 18 months old, and the others 11 and 12 years old. The latter two had to dig their own graves, and the oldest girl was murdered, but the 11-year-old and the baby survived, despite enduring violent assault. Peter Scully is the monster behind this video, and in 2018, he and his girlfriend, who also tortured the children, were sentenced to life in prison for their crimes. Despite the fact that the death penalty was outlawed in the Philippines in 2006, some prosecutors supported the reintroduction of it in this specific case, however it was decided against. In 2015, he revealed he was working on a tell-all journal in prison, which focused on his motivations for doing such vile things. At one point, he was asked why he did it, and he said, what I'm looking for is the reason to it, and what drove me to it, suggesting he doesn't even really know himself. For a while, it wasn't totally clear whether the film was fake, and even now some people doubt its validity when discussing it online, but unfortunately, they are 100% real. I'm sure it's accessible via the dark web somewhere, and it is reportedly still shared on the clearnet, but privately, such as via Facebook Messenger. As with Pseudoscorpion, do not attempt to find this video. It's illegal, and there is literally nothing you can gain from watching it. In 2007, the public became aware of the destruction of around 100 tapes showing enhanced interrogation techniques, which basically means torture, inflicted on two suspected Al-Qaeda suspects. Abu Zubaydah was detained by the CIA in 2002, and a camera was set up to film him constantly. A total of 90 tapes were recorded in the space of eight months, and some of those showed him being tortured using methods such as waterboarding. Abd al-Rahim al-Nashiri was also tortured on camera, though he only featured in two of the tapes. In 2003, members of the US Army and CIA tortured and abused prisoners in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, taking photos of the events which were eventually publicised in 2004. Naturally, there was outrage, and this got the CIA wondering if it was time to destroy their interrogation tapes. They decided against it, however by 2005, several top leadership positions had changed at the CIA, and now different people were in charge. Ultimately, a decision was made to destroy the tapes. 
This was unbeknownst to the public at the time, so the tapes never made their way online, and it's unlikely any copies were made. In 2007, an investigation was launched into the destruction of the tapes, however it was closed nearly three years later, with no criminal charges filed. Palestina or Tina Isa, born in Brazil in 1972, was an American girl who was murdered by her parents in an honour killing in Missouri. Her father, Zine, was a Muslim and her mother, Maria, was a Roman Catholic. When Tina was younger, she had a close relationship with her father, however it deteriorated as she got older and became westernised, so to speak. She liked American music and pop culture and in January 1989, got into a relationship with Cliff Walker. This angered her parents for two reasons, one being that Zine wanted to arrange for Tina to marry a man from his hometown, and the second being that Cliff was African American. Zine reportedly had a disliking towards black people because Palestinian business people had been targeted by black criminals. The family already disapproved of Tina's lifestyle, she attended a prom at school and they sent people to force her to come home. She got a job at Wendy's, but they thought she should be working at the family grocery business. The relationship was the final nail in the coffin, and after finding out about it, Zine made phone calls where he spoke about Tina damaging the family's honour and saying that she needed to die. On the 6th of November 1989, at the age of just 16, Tina was murdered by her father as her mother pinned her down. At the time, Zine was being monitored by the FBI due to his involvement with the Abu Nidal organisation, a terrorist group. They had bugged his house and had therefore recorded Tina's murder on an audio cassette. The FBI refuses to discuss these tapes and only some of them were shown at the trial, so it's not known whether or not they could have prevented the killing. The rest are probably still in possession of the FBI and as far as I'm aware, none have ever emerged online. Both parents were sentenced to death, but neither were actually executed. Zine died in 1997 due to complications from diabetes, and Maria had her sentence reduced to life and died in 2014. Jeffrey Epstein was an American financier who was convicted in 2008 after many allegations that he had sexually abused girls as young as 14. He served just over a year in custody, but was allowed work release. In 2019, he was arrested again on federal charges for the trafficking of minors. The next month, he reportedly took his own life in his jail cell, though many believe he was murdered to prevent him testifying against anyone else. Epstein allegedly installed multiple hidden cameras in various locations around his properties to record guests engaging in inappropriate activities with young girls, then use the footage to bribe them with. Police found hidden cameras when they raided his property in 2006, and in 2018, Epstein said he had dirt on powerful people, specifying activity and recreational drug use. When his apartment was searched following his second arrest, Compact discs were found locked in a safe labelled Young Name plus Name, presumably the name of the young girl in each video and the name of whoever is asking them. None of this apparent footage is publicly accessible and whoever they might feature is a matter of much speculation. Epstein was known to associate with many rich and famous people, including Donald Trump, Bill Clinton and Prince Andrew, and any of them could have appeared in these blackmail tapes. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments, plus any suggestions you might have for a future video. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my Kofi members and channel members whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week in a new video.